dia. Boa noite. Boa noite. Tudo bem? Bonjour, docteur. <risos> je, je vois que vous avez étudié à Paris et que vous êtes membre de médecine sans frontières. Ouais. Je vous remercie. Je vous remercie aussi euh, système français, thaïlandais, cambodgien et brésilien. D'accord, mais on va parler maintenant en anglais pour notre groupe d'étudiants qui est très anglophone. <laughs> so this is this is Professor Professor Victor Rodney, and uh, this is our classroom. I'm gonna turn you to the I'm, so I'm gonna turn you to the classroom so you can face sure. everyone. Uh, you are there in the big screen, so everybody can see you, and I'm gonna introduce you to 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 everybody so they can. They can learn a little bit about you, and then if you want to start, if you want to, you prefer to start with questions, uh, receiving questions, or do you, do you prefer to start talking a little bit of uh, your work with the family health program, or a little bit of uh, your work in the public sector in Brazil? Well, I think I can give you a very brief uh, historical uh, description, and uh, then. Questions. Yeah, I think people have a lot of questions. Uh, have them, uh, but uh, we can, can go on with questions, but I don't know if I have, uh, I have the answers. Uh, we'll try. We'll, we'll do our best. So, so Dr. Daniel Becker, he's a pediatrician. Uh, he's, uh, he, was in, he went to medical school in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. He also has a master's in public health. If you, you correct me if I'm saying something wrong, please. He also has a master's in uh, public health. He specialized in uh, public medicine. Uh, primary care especially. Uh, he was one of the pioneers of the family health program and he's, he wrote many books, he lectures around the world, he worked at the, he, he had, he's lived in Paris for a while, he has experience with the French uh, medical system, he worked for uh, Doctors Without Borders as well in Thailand, Cambodia, so a lot of experience around the world and uh, a lot of experience in primary care and we're I'm very thankful to have him here talking to us a little bit, answering questions about, uh, about Brazil and uh, the, 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 the public health system, Sue's even the, primary, the private health system as well, but this, this mix that Brazil uh, presents to us, that we talked a little bit, we were talking a little bit uh, before. Uh, so I'll let, I'll let So let Dr. Becker just see the class that he's speaking. So about. yeah, let me turn him around. I'm just, I'm just watching out for the cable, I don't want, so this is our class, we have many, many bright, intelligent, amazing students from all over the world and uh, they're going to ask you questions and feel free to, to talk to them and if you need to, I'll, I'll be turning you around so you can talk, so you can talk to them and uh, so do you, if you want to start, if you want to just uh, uh, be, do you want to give a brief talk about the? the but we, we, we only have forty. We only have forty minutes, and perhaps you even have less. Okay. Now I have a first question. So why women are always a majority? In those those kind of uh, nice places, trying to take care of people and so on. Are, 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 are women are, are women physicians a majority now in Brazil? No, no, but in this, in the, in this, class. Well, no, in this no, type no. of settings, I think it is. I mean, not as yeah. female doctors, but in this type of like care, right? Primary yeah. care. We, we have two female medical students. Yes. We have two medical students. We're still well. lie. Accused. Oh. Oh. Did I lose you? No. No, no, no. Okay. no just the big screen. Okay, just, I lost the connection. The cable here is not. In pediatrics, my specialty, nine out of every ten residents are female, uh, yeah. are women. Yeah, but this is not this is not surprising. Anyway, the percentage of men in medical schools has been dropping. Yes, also around here. Well, anyway, um, I'm very glad to be with you. I, I wouldn't say I'm very glad to be here. I'm, I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> I uh, will soon be resting because I had a long day, but I'm very glad to be with you um, and, and especially honored uh, to be uh, participating in a class in New York University. So thank you professors, thank you for the invitation. I hope we can work more together. That's really a, a pleasure for me. Um, what I would like to tell you as an introduction is a little bit of what happened in Brazil 
politically and in sanitary um, terms. Um, in, in this last 40, 30, 40 years in which I participated, I followed this evolution. Um, the first thing that I'm also, I should say, I'm glad <clears throat> about is that people are interested in the U.S. in this moment of so much tension around healthcare reform that you're interested in the Brazilian case. The Brazilian case, uh, although we have very, very serious problems, I think we are one of the very few countries on, in the developing world um, which has a universal, a truly universal system. And this is, I think, a major asset to our country, which is an extremely, extremely unequal country, as you, as you know. And I would say inequality is our main problem, the main cause of uh, loss of health. And um, the, the health system being universal is a a truly session to the this inequality. Unfortunately, it, is, it does not work as it should be because of several problems, lack of investment, lack of funding, lack of uh, quality, um, low capacity for management, which is a main, major, major problem. And also, as you may know from following what's going on in Brazil, corruption is a huge issue in Brazil. So it affects also the, the, the health system. <clears throat> so what happened is that Brazil had, a, a, during the, the, the 20th century, until the, uh, the 80s, we had a, uh, a system which was completely uh, privatized, which is, was basically covering only uh, a few uh, professional categories which had uh, health care based on direct contributions, on so, on kind, of, kind of social security. So we had hospitals for uh, public, uh, public, um, public work, government workers, for bank workers, for industry workers, and so on, so on, and so on. Each one had the different health services, hospitals, so they, 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 they and their families were covered. So most of the, and then, then it, it got, uh, it was amplified was to, 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 to comprehend, to, to include uh, any Brazilian which, which, which had a job, so which has uh, a documented job on, on a, let's say, social security, an active job on his uh, documentation. So he was, uh, he was uh, entitled to the health, the health system provided by also a, a social security organism, what we call Previdência, social security. So it was completely based on direct contributions to social security, either private or afterwards public. So it's very restricted to a few um, categories and, and then a little bit to the, a little bit enlarged to the working population and left out a huge number of people which were completely out. Uh, the best they could get was uh, some few, very few philanthropic officers which would take care of the very neglected socially and some emergency care. Uh, it's curious because I'm almost describing the U.S. system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, this sounds so it was yeah. during the 60s. So, um, what happened was that we had a dictatorship from 64 until the beginning of the 80s. Still, uh, and during this period. The military was also very corrupted. They they worked a lot with uh, with the private sector. They uh, opened uh, the amount the the, 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 uh, the amount of uh, of uh, service provided using private private providers. So it was a lot of 
corruption also in this relationship. Uh, and there was, in, in the other hand, there was a strong movement in Brazil called, we call this Movimento Sanitario, the Sanitary Movement, which was led by uh, basic public health uh, officials, public health researchers, professors, organized in uh, a very activist movement uh, based on a few public health schools and also uh, bringing a little bit from the medical corporation, which were lobbying for a, uh, a public health system, lobbying very strongly. And in 1986, we had a uh, constituent assembly. I don't know. I wouldn't say. I don't know how to say this in English. But a a direct election of a, a special parliament that had that, that elaborated the new constitution after the end of the military dictatorship. So it was, a, it was Assembleia Constituinte. So it was a special election to, to, uh, to choose the deputies and the senators with the power of creating a new constitution. And this was a period of extreme lobbying. And there was a strong um, a strong left-wing lobby from the public health uh, uh, unions and, and, uh, and uh, academy and schools and etc. to create the, uh, the, the constitutional basis for a universal health system. And they succeeded. And they succeeded in, incredibly in spite of very strong forces in the country and outside the country. Uh, fortunately, this was a, a pretty much, um, because we were leaving the detention, this was a pretty much uh, liberal, um, liberal in the non-conservative sense, okay? Not new liberal, <laughs> liberal in the opposite of conservative. It was a very liberal Congress. Uh, more, there was, a, let's say, a little, a little majority. So in spite of pressures from the private sector inside the country, and in spite of pressures from the World Bank and the IMF, which were already uh, lobbying for it was the beginning of the 80s, for um, you know, the, uh, the economic, um, those uh, you know, economic national plans in Brazil, we call ajustes, uh, ajustes economicos. It's, economic adjustment plans in which most of the countries would renounce the public policies to to uh, direct all the, the, the tax money they, they, they could get to pay debts, pay international debt. So there was a strong lobby for Brazil not to have a public health system, which would be very expensive, a universal system. And in spite of that, we won. And, uh, this, this, the what we call SUS, Sistema Único de Saúde, was created in 1988. Yeah, I was, was sorry to interrupt. Uh, we, I, I mean, we started when I, we started the class. We talked a little bit about the create now, now about this. What I, I didn't everything that you said. It's new to them. I know we didn't even mention that. So it's good even for me. I, I mean, I love this. It's, it's, it's good stuff. Uh, it's good to hear this. Uh, well, we talked. We started talking. We started the class talking after the creation of SUS. So they already had a, like a little introduction on the creation of SUS. So maybe now, I think, since they heard about the creation of SUS after the uh, after the, this this whole constitution and now after this the, the the creation of the unified health system, maybe now they can we can turn to them to ask some questions about that because they already and they did some readings at least they were supposed to uh, on that. So let's let's can can we open for some questions? I would just finish by, by saying one, one more thing. The creation of SUS uh, uh, implied in the expansion of its clientele, let's say, quote, uh, from a few millions to 120 millions, which was the Brazilian population at the time. And there was a very, very deep problem of uh, 
model, how do you say this um, model of care? There's a better expression in English for that. Community? How we provide care for these people. Mm -hmm. Now, care was based on hospitals most of the time. Yeah. It was uh, secondary and tertiary hospitals. This was the Brazilian tradition and so far. There was very, very uh, few health uh, health centers. There were not community health centers, but they were uh, not territorially uh, based. They were not covering territories. It was, they were sparse. They were of low prestige. Well, people would go there basically for vaccinations. Uh, they call vaccination posts, although they have doctors like, uh, you know, pediatricians or, or OBGYNs or, yeah. or dermatologists for, for, for Hansen or pneumologists for tuberculosis. They were very basic and of low prestige. What was of high prestige was emergency care. In emergency care, we know how costly it is, how unsatisfactory it is, how inefficient, how ineffective. It, it's what we call the, the low end of any, any health care. <laughs> And Brazil, Brazil has all its, let's say, outpatient care based in emergencies. People were going to emergencies for daily care. They would go to emergencies to back pain for uh, um, any kind of you know, you know, child diseases. There was no child follow-up, almost very, very badly uh, organized. Uh, there were a few vertical programs, you know, all of them famous UNICEF uh, and WHO vertical programs like diarrhea, disease, respiratory disease, uh, child development, and, and, and uh, breastfeeding, etc. Very also sparse. So there was no model of care. There was no um, the, 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 the precursors and, and, uh, and uh, the people who were the managers of the system didn't know what to do. And this was a big opportunity for the lobbyists, the, our, for our group, which was uh, basically trying to lobby for primary health care to jump in. Because we had a proposal. There was no other proposal. So there was a very good opportunity because of the, of the scarcity of, of uh, provides of, of, of health provision models. And the return of primary health care on a territorial basis was a big opportunity. So this is a chapter that we, we can talk a little bit ahead. So please go on with the questions if, if whatever I would be able to answer. So first, let's turn it over to the class. If you had any questions based on the readings or based on anything that Raphael has said that you want to address because this was an opportunity first for you.